pastor. I had all the answers. I could say all the right things. Mm -hmm. I could express all this and everybody, but I was lost as anything. And that was his testimony. Well, Linda, my wife, went forward in church when she was eight years old in Bible school. They put her name on the roll. She filled out a card, and she got baptized, and she grew up in church. She's never missed a dozen Sundays in church in her life. You know, She grew up in the church. She sang in the choir. She was the pastor's secretary. She... Uh, did everything, and she was lost as she could be, and that's her testimony. Uh, didn't come to Christ till she got about 19 or 20 years old. Mm -hmm. But everybody said, well, she's a good girl. She's always here every time the door's open, you know. She's uh, teaching Sunday school, children in Sunday school, works in the church office, helping the preacher, sings in the choir, does it all, but lost as she could be. Well, that's what Paul came on in Ephesus. And I believe, because you know and I know, that when you talk to somebody, and they start telling them, yeah, I go to this church, or I go to that church, you know, and they beat all around the bush, but they never come to the point. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know in your heart, they're not, they're not really Christians. They're, they're just religious people. I think Paul was that way when he got to Ephesus. And he said, did you receive the Holy Spirit? They said, we don't even know who the Holy Spirit is. We've not even heard of him. Well, you can't be saved. The Bible says if you don't have the Spirit, then you're not a child of God. As, you know, as many as are led of the Spirit, these are the children of God. So they said, well, he said, well, you said you got baptized. They said, well, John baptized us. He said, well, his baptism is to repentance. He was calling the Jews to repent and turn back to worshiping God, but not to receiving Jesus Christ. That was our Sunday school lesson this morning. Wasn't it good? I enjoyed yeah. it. And then Paul preached unto him Jesus. Now, here's, here's where I say the controversy is all coming in. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. Now, there are denominations that say you get baptized in the Holy Spirit later than when you believe. It's a separate experience. And you can only get the Holy Spirit when somebody lays hands on you. And they take that and run with it. That's not true. I think Paul put his hands on them because he was full of the Holy Spirit. He wasn't giving them the Holy Spirit. He just wanted them to sense, to experience what it was to be with someone who was full of the Holy Spirit. And then he went on to say, placed his hands on them. Uh, on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. There are denominations that don't baptize. We baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, which is the scripture. Upon your public profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We say buried with Christ and resurrected in the newness of life. But there are denominations that only baptize in Jesus' name, and they say if you use the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, it's not real baptism because it's not their baptism. Mm -hmm. Just like the Church of Christ says, our baptism didn't count. The only real baptism is to be baptized in their building by their man. Mm -hmm. If you're not baptized in the Church of Christ building by a Church of Christ preacher, then your baptism wasn't real. And they believe that. Mm -hmm. And all that's junk. That's just chasing rabbits out in the woods. It don't mean a thing. Then he goes on to say, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Well, the word prophesied means preach, witness, testify, and speaking in tongues. Uh, we covered speaking in tongues a while back, but there's 
there's two tongues, types of tongues mentioned in the Holy, in the New Testament. On the day of Pentecost, uh, when the Holy Spirit came on, uh, when they were in the upper room of the Holy Spirit, let me get it right. They all began to speak in tongues. That was languages for which they were not trained. We know that. That's what the Bible says. That's the word. Now, there is a tongue, glossia, which only the Holy Spirit under, uh, understands. We don't preach and teach that for this simple reason. Jesus said, when we don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit in, intercedes for us with groans and utterings. He's standing right there at the Father saying, you hear what they're saying. They don't know really how to pray. They don't know really how to express themselves. But their heart's genuine. So I'm asking you to bless them based on the fact that Jesus gave his blood for them. And that's what we're talking about here. Uh, people want to take things that aren't important and make them big issues in the church. I was preaching a revival in Enterprise, Alabama. Golly, it's been 40 years ago. And this Church of God, Kurt Walk, they had posters all over town with my picture on. This Church of God preacher walked up to me and said, do you speak in tongues? And I said, no. Uh, you know, I just pray the best I can. You're not even saved. He, huh. just, he felt like God had died and appointed him to be my judge, you know. And then he started speaking in gibberish, you know. Walk off down the road doing that. Um, he'd never seen me before in, in his life. But, you know, he felt that he needed to pronounce judgment on me mm. and walked away. And there are people who make big issues out of things that are important, but they're not the main thing. The main thing is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Mm -hmm. Confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and God will give you eternal life. That's the main thing. And it's like, There are churches who don't believe in tithing. That's scriptural. They say, well, that's Old Testament. That's under the law. Well, if you go back to Genesis, Abraham tithed to Melchizedek 400 years before the law was ever given by God to Moses. And God said it's the right thing to do. And then in Malachi, it says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse and prove me herewith, saith the Lord. And see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. Well, I'm sitting here to tell you the windows of heaven are open and God's blessed me. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the you know, some churches, uh, I think it's under the leadership of the preacher. Yeah. And the okay. customs they do. Yeah. I know a church in our association that don't believe in fundraising. They don't do no fundraising. Everybody should tithe. Yeah. They should do all the Business should come from the church side. Yeah. No fundraising. And this right across the room. I mean, pretty close to Yeah. Down. Well, I know something like that. Too. Different, yeah. different preachers do different yeah, it's their thing, But it's not what I think or Patrick. It's what God says in his word. That's right. I know a church where I preached a revival there. It's way up above Macon. And this guy came in. He attended there when he attended. You know, he wasn't a regular attender. Mm -hmm. He came Christmas and Easter and that's Mother's Day and yeah, like that. But he won the state lottery. And he came to the pastor and said, I want to give like $100,000 to the church. And this pastor said, no, we don't want it. That's the devil's money. Well, the devil gave it long enough. Yeah. Give it to God. Hey, that's right, I think. That's how I feel about it, too. So we take all of the devil's money we can get our hands yeah, on. Right. Uh, he used it long crazy. enough. He used it. But they turned him down. He went, he went down to another big church and gave it, and they accepted it and paid off a lot of debt with it or something. Right. 
And uh, why not let God's people be blessed? It don't matter if it comes in, take it and use it for God. And that's all I'm saying. All right, Romans 8, 9 to 11. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. That's enough right there. You're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if the spirit of God is in you. Uh, praise his holy name. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. That's self-explanatory, but the Holy Spirit gives us eternal life. The Bible says we will never perish Jesus said, those that my Father give unto me, no man can pluck them out of my hand. For my Father who gave them to me is greater than all. We're in the hand of Jesus. His hand's in the hand of the Father. And we have eternal life in the Holy Spirit by faith in Him. And that's what he's talking about here. For as many as are led of the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself, himself, bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. All right, now, Paul talks about this all through Romans. We are the children of adoption. I like the scripture which te teaches us we are the engrafted. We're not born Jews, but we're now. God looks at us, we're justified by faith in Jesus because we're whosoever will. We believed in Jesus. The Spirit of God lives in us. We have been adopted. Now, I know this because I learned this in Atlanta from the head of the Bar Association of Georgia. We were talking. I was up there. I was invited up there to have a prayer. And we were talking about different things, and he brought this up. Jerry just had a family reunion. He was telling me about all the family that was there, the daughter and all that, and that's good. We have two sons and two daughters. I can legally disown them. I can disown them so that they receive nothing on my death, no inheritance, anything else. They can't, they can't uh, use me as a reference or anything else. But the law of the United States of America and the state of Georgia is you cannot disown an adopted child because you chose and went through the legal ramifications of adopting that child and getting the paperwork and all like that. We don't have any adopted children. But if we did, you can't disown an adopted child. Because you made that decision and went through the courts of law and everything else. So we're the children of adoption. God would never disown us anyway. I was reading this afternoon, 2 Peter 2.20. The Bible says there, for if we have escaped the pollutions of this world through our through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we are again entangled therein. The latter end is worse with us than the beginning. 
It would have been better never to have been born than to hear that Jesus saves and walk away from it. That's what it's talking about. not talking about losing your salvation. It's talking about you know how to get saved. You know how to get clean. You know how to have the Holy Spirit in you. And you understand it. You heard it clearly. And uh, then you just turn around and say, I'll do that later, something like that. There's nowhere else can you go. And Simon Peter said to Jesus, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. It's through you that we get eternal life. Where else could we go? We don't have anywhere else to turn. Talking about the adoption, I heard one time where they was, you know, some elderly children, you yeah. know, some that was born into the family and some that was adopted into the family and the children that were born into the family was cutting them down for some reason. And uh, then the adopted child came back and told them, said, look, said, our parents and all said they chose me. Right. But said they didn't get a chance to choose you. That's they just right. hadn't yet to know what you know what That's they were right. giving. And uh, and and that just kind of cut it off right there. And I heard, I don't know it, I just heard about it through another preacher. Mm -hmm. That this old guy died and he owned a lot of land and cattle. And he just put in his will from his lawyer, I just owned all my children. But the adopted one came back and said, I want, I want it. And the law said he was entitled to it. The others he could, could be disowned, but the adopted son, which he adopted from his sister or brother or something, but wasn't fully legally adopted, said, I want what he had, and they had to give it to him because he was uh, legally entitled to it. All right, on page five, Oh, we're in the good part here. I love all this. Page 5 at the top of the page, Romans 8, 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray. For we ought, for as we ought, we don't know what to pray for. But the Spirit himself makes intercession. And I, I hadn't even read this. Makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. I love this intercession. He's there always always present pleading for you and for me pleading our cause he said lord they're so weak-minded they don't really know what they ought to pray for but i know what they need so father i'm here with groanings and utterings i'm here pouring myself out to you saying meet their need don't give them what they want Give them what they need. Uh, I, I, Y'all have heard me say this many times. But I remember the first time I heard it. Somebody was saying that when we are praying lots of times, we're like an old bulldog chasing the greyhound bus. We don't know what we'd do with it if we caught it. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and that's about the truth of it. <laughs> we pray for stuff. If God let us have it, we, it ruins us. We don't know what we do with it. Uh, now, he searches the hearts, knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession as the saint, for the saints according to the will of God. Now, he makes intercession for us. Jesus is our advocate, and the Holy Spirit is our intercessor. And the advocate is, the, the Bible says there's one advocate 
between God and man, and that's Jesus Christ. You remember the, t the story I told you? I remember it like it was this morning. This was 65 years ago. I was as tall as I am now, and I went to the doctor this week, and they measured my height, and I'm six feet and a quarter inches tall right now, six feet and one quarter inches. When I was 18 years old, when in the military, I was six feet two. But all these years, I've compacted down, you know, all the cartilage and all the joints is worn out. I've shrunk about an inch or two, so all of us have. But, uh, so, I was surprised when they said, the nurse said, how tall are you? And I said, well, I used to be 6'2 when I went into service. And she said, well, you're six feet and a quarter inch now. And she, and she explained it, you know, as you grow older, you shrink. And I, I have, I'm, I'm, no, no doubt about it. But Jesus lives to make intercession for us. And I, what I was going to tell you is, I was preaching in this little bitty tiny country church one Sunday morning all those years ago. I was probably 6'2 then. And I weighed 155 pounds. <laughs> and today I got on the scale every morning when I get out of the shower. Today I weigh 200 and too much. <laughs> too, too much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably 60 pounds heavier than I was in them days. You know what I mean? But this, I was preaching in this church and I got through and stepped down here because it was a custom that they came by in the front, not at the door, and shook your hand. And this woman come walking down that center aisle and she was hitting pews on both sides. Mm -hmm. She, If she weighed a pound, she weighed five to six hundred. And she said, God has given me a message for you. She said, God told me you need to fast. <laughs> and I, I looked about like that. And it was, you, know, honey, you can see me now at 155 pounds. I just a little skinny kid, you know. And I thought, I didn't say it. I, mean, I thought, Lord, who needs to fast? You can't even get down the double wide center aisle of the church without bumping the pews on both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, so I said that to say God doesn't send us second hand information. If God wants you to know something, he'll tell you. Right. He wants me, and he tells us from the word. Like I was telling you this afternoon, I was just reading the Bible and I was reading over there in Peter about People who just, we're living in the day of apostasy. When people just walk away from God, turn their back on him. They, you know, uh, if we was out in the middle of the ocean, and I've been out there, and fell overboard, and it's three, four hundred miles in every direction to dry land, we'd want somebody to throw us a life raft or a life exactly. circle, wouldn't we? We want to, they told me that life jacket. I want to put it on. Yeah, I'm out here. I can't swim that far. And people are just like that, lost in sin, and they can't get anywhere on their own. And they need us to throw them a life jacket and say, here's Jesus. He's going to keep you afloat till you get to safety. And uh, that's what it's all about. Now, he is our advocate. But the Holy Spirit, and he, he's the go-between Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is too. But the Holy Spirit is interceding. He's there pleading our cause. Jesus tells us what God wants us to know, and the Spirit does too. But he's there pleading. Our, he says, we don't even know how to pray. And I have to, I have to say to you, I still say to God on a regular basis, just what the disciples, you know, he chose, Jesus chose 12. They followed him the entire time he was on earth. His ministry lasted three and a half years. 
The first miracle he performed was turning water into wine at the wedding feast of Cana in Galilee. It's recorded in the Bible he went to five different funerals and raised the dead at five different funerals. I mean, they were dead. They, he's gone, finished. He gave sight to Barnabas, was born blind. He's not somebody who got eye infection, went blind later. They said, have you heard Jesus is coming by? Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus walked over to him and said, what do you want? He wanted him to express his need because sometimes we have a problem and we'd rather whine about the problem than tell God we need help with it. You know that. You've seen that. There are people in churches everywhere and all they want to do is walk around whining and complaining. They don't, you know, well, I had to go to the doctor and I'm sick and I, I'm having migraine headaches because I watched General Hospital five times this week. And it's just giving me a migraine. And what we need to understand is they, they saw Jesus do all the miracles. Restore withered hand, cast out demons, give sight to the blind, raise the dead. But the only thing they ever ask is, Lord, teach us to pray. Mm -hmm. Teach us to pray. That's the only thing in the whole Bible they ever ask him to do. Lord, teach us how to pray. And I pray that often. I say, Lord, teach me how to pray better. I don't know how to pray. Uh, I tell myself, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to stop here and pray for 15 minutes. I'm going to just pour my heart out to God. Well, in five minutes, my mind's wandering way off out here in the field somewhere. And I'm, I'm in the middle of a cotton patch or a cornfield or something, you know. Our minds wander. And remember, I told you, when Linda and I was in Israel, all of the Jewish people, we went to the Wailing Wall, and you go down there, and they got all these men standing back there, and uh, they gave me one of those little caps. You can't go to the Wailing Wall without one of their little Jewish caps on your head. And uh, then they put a little thing around my neck and I went down there and stood and they got these black hats on and the long sideburns. They're standing there praying like this. And I thought, man, what in the world is praying? And they're just pouring their heart out in prayer. And I mentioned that later to several people I was with and they say, you can concentrate better doing that. And you can you don't believe me when you get home and you don't want people to think you're crazy. Just pray and do this. And you can your mind won't wander near as much as if you just bow your head. Because I, I can tell myself, man, I'm gonna spend some time in prayer. And my mind just wanders here. I, I, next thing I said, I was trying to pray. And here I am thinking about this or that. That may never happen to y'all, but it sure yeah, happens to me. It sure happens to me. My, my mind will wander off. And I have the best intention in the world. But Linda's daddy was a fine Christian man, a deacon, Sunday school teacher. And he used to say all the time, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. <laughs> and he was right. I have the best intentions I'm going to say. I'm going to spend this time in prayer. I'm going to spend this time in Bible study. I'm going to spend this time interceding for other people because I like to pray for all of y'all. I got a list at home. And I do. I don't mean I fail every time, but my mind wanders, and that's the truth. I don't know. It's just, it'll just wander off somewhere. Sometimes you don't know how to pray for other people. Oh, yeah, you, you don't. don't you know what their real needs are. Just a general prayer. Oh, I come here on like Wednesday night or in Sunday school class, and some of y'all will say something about somebody else. Be specific. And I'll say, I didn't know that about them. I didn't know they were had been in the hospital or they were gonna have an operation. I didn't know they're having, you know, something bad wrong inside them. Now I know better how to pray for them. And uh, it helps to write everything down because I can't remember it. <laughs> That's the truth. It helps to keep a journey. All right, where are we now? 
First Corinthians three sixteen. No, no. Two, two, ten, two ten through fourteen. But God has revealed them to us through His Holy Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given us by God. So we can know, I know that I'm blessed. I know that I have prayed and do almost every day for spiritual wisdom. And God has given me spiritual wisdom because there's things that I couldn't understand on my own. There's things I couldn't share with other people on my own, in my own limited wisdom. But it comes from the Holy Spirit of God and that's what he's talking about here. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, listen to this now, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. The natural man. How many people have told you in your own family or in, here in church or somewhere else? Well, I've got a Bible and I've tried to read it, but it don't make any sense to me. I can't get anything out of it. I can't remember it. I don't know what it meant. This is what he's talking about here. The natural man, the unsaved man, man in the flesh, the man the way we were born, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. The only way anybody's ever going to read the Bible is to get saved and get the Holy Spirit in you, and he will help us. Doesn't mean I know everything and I understand the whole Bible. There's parts of it I know that I'll need explained to me when I get to heaven. I don't know anybody that knows it all. I know some that know a lot more than me. But I don't know anybody that can just go through the whole Bible and explain it all. And some people just pick little pet parts and jump on that and stay with it, hammer away on it. But it's the whole counsel, the entire Bible that we need to understand. Amen. God, you know, God didn't put Leviticus in there by chance. He put it in there on purpose so we can learn from it. Uh, Ecclesiastes, same thing. These are books we don't normally read. You've heard me say because I preached it from the pulpit. In the New Testament, if, I, if there's one book that I just dearly love because I think it's the most neglected book in the whole New Testament, that's Philemon. Paul writing this letter to his friend. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a simple little short letter. It's only not even a full page in most Bibles, just a half a page or a big paragraph. Uh, Philemon was a well-to-do businessman, a Christian, and the church met in his house because there were no church buildings until the year 250 A.D. It was 250 years after Jesus died on the cross before the first building like this was built. And you read the book of Acts and they met from house to house. They met in the marketplace. They met in the cemetery. And I've had meetings in Africa in the cemetery because that was the biggest cleared spot in the whole area, you know, so everybody could get in there and stand between the graves and worship. But uh, 
no buildings like this at all. But the thing that we need to understand is the things of God are spiritually discerned. And we learn from the Holy Spirit about the things of God. He intercedes for us. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? This is the church house. This is the temple of God. God dwells in here, not in here. When we leave tonight, turn out the lights and there's no nobody in here God's not in this building well he's everywhere but I'm mean, you know it's when we come together and we're the body of Jesus Christ we're Paul wrote to the Corinthian he said no two of us are alike and I'm thankful for that I don't mean that in the wrong way no two of us have the same spiritual gifts no two of us have the same talents no two of us have the same ability. That man right there has got more business sense and knowledge and experience than my poor little feeble body could ever attain. You know, he told me one morning in Sunday school how many businesses he started, and they've all succeeded. And uh, I couldn't start a shoe shine business and make it work. You know, I just don't have. That's not my ability. I don't have the ability to lead in businesses and conduct businesses and all like that. I am too much of a pushover. Uh, if it comes to me and you and who's going to get the better end of the deal, I, in my heart, I want you to have the better end of the deal. I, you know, uh, I can't, I can't do that. I have a good friend. He can pick up a handful of dirt and sell it. For a profit, you know what I mean? He man, our brother Tony's probably that way. Yes, we had a wonderful preacher, Linda and I talked about him this week. An Indian preacher, Nelson Abraham. And everybody in the province where his parents came from had a biblical name, Abraham, Thomas, Jonah. That was their surname. And Nelson was one of the leaders in the Baptist Union in South Africa, a good man of God. Oh, he was a, I came, I went to Durban, which is way up on the Indian Ocean. Incidentally, the greatest population of Indian people in the world outside of India are in South Africa. In KwaZulu Natal, that's a province bigger than the state of Texas or Alaska, in the 1700s, the British brought hundreds of Indian people from India because they were in, India was one of their colonial nations then. They since gained independence. But they brought them to South Africa because it's all mountains to build railways through the mountains. Even though they're not engineers, even though they're not scholars, even though they can't sit down at a drafting board, and draw everything out. They have a natural ability to build railways through mountains. I mean, they can just find a way and build good railways, and that's what they brought them over there for. Uh, and they're just good people of God. I mean, really, most of them are sold out Christians. But they know that they've never had real good, they do today, but they didn't for all those years have any kind of church building. But they could, they could come together in the worst circumstances in the world and have church because the church is us, not the building. Mm -hmm. When we come together, <coughs> the church is in session. As I said, we don't have the same talents, the same abilities. We can't do the same things. Uh, there's not a whole lot I can do. I try to preach, but that's, 
I know that's God's will for my life. And I, I'm never going to stop trying. I'm never going to quit or anything like that. But we need to understand that God has put us together to make up his church because each one of us, some more so than the other, have a lot more to contribute to making this church what it is. Uh, and that's what's important. 1 Corinthians 12, 3 to 11 and 13. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. People can say Jesus is Lord, but they can't say it mean. I've heard people that were just renegades say, well, Jesus is Lord. But they were the furthest thing in the world from a Christian to be real and genuine and mean it that Jesus is Lord. He has to be Lord in your life, in your heart. He has to be Lord of you. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. Well, I just got through talking about that too, didn't I? There are different men, differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. We, we get, we're blessed because of each other. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. For by one Spirit we were baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. Well, he's just... Driving home the truth. This is the truth. We don't all have the same gifts. We don't all have the same abilities. We don't all have the same talents. We don't all. But all of us together, it takes it to make the body whole. Uh, I've told y'all before. My mother come from a family of ten children. One boy and nine girls. And her brother was on a ship in World War II. He's long been dead. And that ship was torpedoed. They were going to England, taking military supplies over there. He woke up in the hospital in England. I think he'd been unconscious for three or four weeks. And his left arm was missing. He didn't know where he was or anything else. And there's a funny story that goes with that. I don't know if I've ever told you. My grandfather, my mother's father, was a Dutch sea captain from the Netherlands. He was Dutch. And he came to the United States and they got shipwrecked off Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. And they wanted to get back to Holland, the Netherlands. And they said, well, you have to go to New Orleans to get a ship back. There wasn't one out of up north going back, but they knew there was one going back. Only teletype was found. So him and the whole crew started through from North Carolina to New Orleans. And on the way, he met my grandmother and said, y'all go back, I'm staying. And he was an educated man. He played the violin and all this stuff. 
but my mother's maiden name was Vanderpool. That wasn't the original name. They Americanized it in 1920. The original name was Fondaport. But none, none of the red, V-A-N-D-E-R-B-O-O-R-T. But these are pronounced F's in Dutch. Fondaport. And so none of the rednecks down in South Mississippi could say Fondaport very good. So they just changed it to Vanderpool because Ford was a popular name in the U.S. So, my uncle woke up in the hospital in London with his arm missing. And there were sailors off ships, all the allied countries from France and uh, Poland and all the countries that were on our side in that hospital. And this doctor, this English doctor, come walking in and picked up the, his chart and saw his name was Otto von der Ford. And he walked over to him and leaned over and said, do you speak English? And my uncle looked up and said, very, very little. <laughs> very, very little. But he could speak English good because he grew up in South Mississippi. That's his joke. But I told you about my uncle because I loved him. And I followed him in this little boy everywhere. He, he had a hole that he had balanced. Don't ask me how he balanced it. He had an ax that he had balanced. So he could take that ax and cut as much wood, split wood, we all burned wood, cooked on wood stove. He could hoe in the field all day with that one hand as good as any man could. He wore bib overalls like we all did. He'd open that top button and take out a can of Prince Albert, flip that lid up and scratch it, get out one paper, turn that can up and tap it, and roll a cigarette as good as any you've ever seen. And I just was amazed at that. I'd always like, he smoked Prince Albert. He could roll a perfect cigarette with one hand because he learned how to do it. So, But I said all of that to tell you about my Uncle Otto because I loved it. The thing that he said to me one time when he drove a Model T, because you didn't have to shift gears, it's got three pedals, you know, the center pedal was the reverse, and then the brake and the gas. And he drove, always drove a Model T because he could drive it with one hand and not have to shift or anything. And one thing, one time me and him was going somewhere and I was sitting in the seat beside him, a little boy. And he said, ever since I've lost my arm, I don't feel complete anymore. I just don't feel complete since I've lost him. Even though he could do as much as any man I've ever seen, he could take a buck saw and saw wood, you know. Not a cross cut anymore, but a buck saw. And uh, I said that to say this. We are the body of Christ. And those who won't come make the body incomplete. And we're not what Jesus died for the body to be. It takes all of us to make our body here at Brooklyn whole. Every one of us. And then Paul talks about that. Uh, he said, for the body to be complete, the ear needs the eye, and the eye needs the nose, and the hand needs the foot. And the foot can't say to the hand, I don't need you. And now I can't say to the ear, I don't need you, because we wouldn't be complete unless we had them all. And that's the way it is. We're the body of Christ, this church. It's time to quit. But we need us all. And we need to love the ones that aren't here and do something to get them in here. That's all I'm saying. That's what he's talking about here. And it's the Holy Spirit of God. It gives us all the gifts and all the talents. But uh, she's recording this. She records all of our services, you know. And people watch that on Facebook. We need her bad and what she can contribute. Because I can't do what she's doing. 
I got a phone, but I don't know what to do with this phone. I have to ask my grandkids. I can turn it on and say hello, but that's about all I can do. Are you praying? No. No. You should be. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all heard me get my orders. Man. Well, I can't do anything without you, so. Jerry, pray for us. And they're standing out front. He does. Heavenly Father, we come before you this time just to thank you, Heavenly Father, for who you are and what you have done for us. Heavenly Father, you are awesome. There is nothing or no one or anything else greater than you. And I thank you so much for your Holy Spirit that you have sent to live and then dwell within each and every one Amen. of us, Heavenly Father, to guide us in the way that we need to go. And I thank you for people like Linda and all that just keep us back on track. Amen. Heavenly Father, the Holy Spirit does the same thing. He, keeps us on track, and I thank you for it. I pray now that you'll be with the ones and all that are sick, that need you, and operations, and things and all that are going on. Uh, Vicki, and Stephanie, and, and, and everybody. Amen. Heavenly Father, we need you, and we thank you, and praise you, and thank you for what you're going to do tomorrow, not just what you've done in the past. Amen. We love you and praise your holy name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I hope y'all, I'm getting so much fun out of this. I hope y'all get something like this. Jerry, you want to put that back?